welcome back to another episode of the open source cafe and uh, this is a part of an, uh, an ongoing series uh, that we have started with sima focused around career development where you can learn about all the amazing years of experiences of matt who has joined us here today so matt first of all thanks a lot for joining and volunteering to also you know uh, i know we did the discord event and now we're doing a series on uh, a series on some some topics that have been mostly requested by so many people before we get started would you like to tell our viewers a, a little bit more about yourself absolutely and thanks again kunal and had such a pleasure on the discord chat i know i know how much fun this is going to be so i'm matt van italy uh, i grew up in a town of about 40,000 people in new york state so uh, a few hours from new york city i now live in baltimore maryland which is near washington dc uh, I learned to code uh, uh, when I was five. Um, my parents are coders. Uh, my mom was one of the first coders at IBM and then became a math teacher. Uh, so we've always had a lot of technology in, in my family. Uh, my professional career spent was spent mostly on the, the business and the organizational side of code. Uh, so put in technology systems, used tech, uh, worked at software companies and technology organizations even work with school districts uh, to use software to help uh, improve teaching and learning. Um, I, I, after working for many years in, uh, in and around tech and with software organizations, I really fell in love with and became obsessed with code quality and technical debt and helping coders um, learn more and grow more and advance their careers. Uh, one of the things I observed was so many organizations were trying to treat coders like, let's say, salespeople or people who work on an assembly line. It, and code is really different. Coding is really different. It's a craft, uh, not a competition. And so I founded SEMA uh, to help uh, to help work on those topics, improving code quality for uh, for users, uh, for coders, because of course better code is easier to use. Uh, and also, it's just the right thing to do. Uh, we have an obligation in the coding community to back to the code because it's done so much for us. And so I, I think code quality matters for its own sake. Uh, and then also help developers learn more, advance their careers, and hopefully soon enough uh, make the interviewing process a little bit better because <laughs> we all know it, it could be a lot better than it is. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And uh, thanks a lot for, like, you know, uh, sharing about SEMA as well. For folks who want to get started, the links uh, can be found in the description below. But uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the the product itself before we move on with the agenda that we have here today? By the way, today we're talking about learning in public in this session because it's one of the highly requested uh, you know, topics from the community. Before we move, before we move forward, uh, speaking of, let's say, learning in public itself, how can, how does SEMA uh, you know, support that? We have um, uh, we had a special guest intern. That's my son Calvin. <laughs> um, so how um, a little bit more about the SEMA product? So it is um, a code review and developer portfolio tool. Right now, it's only available for GitHub. Um, we're going to go to other version control systems uh, soon. What it does is uh, make code reviews themselves a little bit more structured so that they're clearer to the audience, uh, to the code author, uh, and also dashboardable. If you think about it, all the code reviews you've done, you've probably never uh, looked at those code review results uh, data again because it's it's unstructured and it's across all of, the, all of those different pull requests. We've built a way by structuring that data to also create dashboards that are analyzable and explorable. Uh, two more parts I'd say. One is uh, another feature is the ability to take best practices, whether they're from your organization, um, whether they're from the community. We have 20,000 best practices that can be inserted, or they're just the comments you would use uh, every day and just insert them back in. So you're not um, reinventing the wheel, uh, retyping a, suggest a, a comment every, every time. And it also references back the original source. And then finally, uh, be, through this dashboard and through structuring this data, uh, you can easily create uh, portfolios. Uh, and those portfolios can be about your own accomplishments uh, to support a resume, uh, to keep track of what you've been working on. Some people call that an accomplishment journal or a brag book. 
But also, if that's about the person, you can also create a portfolio about the code. And one of the really cool um, uses, and shout out to uh, Eddie at Eddie Hub for, uh, for inventing this use, because it's amazing, is to have a readme file for new engineers to a project that's not just, here's documentation, it's not just read the code and tell us what you think, but here are engineers whose reviews you should read and then click through into the code and see great examples or less great examples. So it's a way to ramp up on a, uh, a, new, uh, applica a new application or project more quickly. Uh, to get started with it, uh, it, is, um, uh, it is a free tool. And again, the only requirement is uh, that you use GitHub. You can just go to seamasoftware.com and click, um, uh, click join the waitlist. Uh, we want a waitlist because we're letting folks in deliberately. We really want to make sure the product is fully polished um, before we uh, move to general uh, release. But anyone listening to this who's a friend of Kudal must care enough about code quality that we would be glad to let you in. So just go to the top right, click on join the wait list, and we'll let you in shortly. Amazing. And uh, speaking speaking of which, now you know, coming back to the discussion of like learning in public, for folks who may be new, let's talk a little bit more about. So you so you mentioned about some of some like following good practices practices in open source and you know, like collaborating with people and Eddie, uh, you know, shares a lot of great resources. So shout out to Eddie for that as well. But can you share a little bit more about for someone who may be new about like, what is learning in public? Yeah, I love talking about learning in public, in part because I had to learn how to do it. And my, my instincts were incorrect. Uh, and those of you who love learning is probably everyone on this call, uh, being able to talk about something you did wrong is so satisfying, because it means you're learning something new. So the idea of learning in public is share a question as broadly as possible rather than sharing it privately. And let's give some maybe some specific examples. Uh, first in open source and open source projects and communities, 999 times out of 1,000, if you have a question, you should put it in a public Slack channel, a public Discord channel, uh, and... Uh, open it up to the community for anyone to answer, not just an individual, uh, not just an individual person. That's in an open source context, uh, in a company context. Uh, so let's use SEMA. We have 45 amazing folks in 25 different countries. Uh, it is almost always the right answer to um, ask your question in a public, we use Slack, in a public Slack channel rather than um, uh, rather than a private one. So the risk of doing this in public is that you might be asking a dumb question. Uh, and I'm using air quotes here. Um, here. Here is what I would say about that. If you're asking it, it's almost certain that somebody else is al already thinking it, also thinking it. Um, nothing is as clear as creators think it is. Uh, I know I know it's true for me. I, I write things and think it's clear, but they're never clear enough. So by you asking in public, you're letting other people in, you're doing a service to other questioners, to other questioners, and equally important, and maybe more important, you're doing an incredible favor to the answerer. Uh, so when you send a message to an individual person uh, in a channel, the only person who can answer that is that person, because nobody else knows. And especially for open source projects, uh, it's uh, the maintainers who you might be sending it to. There's contributors, there's maintainers. Maintainers are the leaders of the project. Um, uh, they organize, they answer questions, they welcome. Uh, they're so busy. <laughs> they're so busy. And so when you ask a question privately, it's on them to take care of. Whereas if you ask it in a public channel, Someone else can answer. Uh, someone else can answer it as well. Uh, I'm a member of a few communities where not only uh, is the best is the recommended approach to put it in a public channel, but also not even tag a maintainer um, or a person. That depends on the situation. Um, so I would look. Uh, I would watch first before deciding whether or not to add someone or not. Uh, but definitely in. Um, Definitely, in almost every possible situation, I would ask it in public. 
I, I, it's also going to help you because if you ask in public, then more folks are going to see your uh, question and it'll get answered very fast as compared to if you just DM folks. But yeah, uh, that, that was just like, a, you know, a, a, a part of like learning in public, which was uh, asking good questions. And I love the fact you mentioned about your team across 26 uh, countries. So folks may be wondering how does the communication happen? And uh, how do you make sure that you're not getting like blocked because of the major time zone differences? So you have such a tremendous experience in working remotely. How does that happen? Sure. Um, we're not perfect at it by any means. We, we definitely get blocks um, for sure. I, I think an engineering process or really any process, there's always going to be blockers. And so in the spirit of continuous improvement, um, finding the blockers and being honest about it, it is a huge part. Uh, let me, a quick aside, some of you may know um, the concept of psychological safety. Um, I'm a huge fan of it. And uh, I think it it's a really important determinant of organizational success. So if I can, can all a minute or two on this, because I think it helps answer. So psychological safety, in summary, is do you and do your colleagues feel safe at work? Uh, and the safety is around asking questions, is around asking hard questions or uncomfortable questions, and it's also around uh, making suggestions or criticisms. Uh, now, a whole other session is the right place and when you should be criticizing in public or not. But, you know, boil it down. Could I talk to someone and feel safe about saying something about um, something that's not good, something that's wrong, and still um, still be okay, not be criticized, not be attacked, not be fired, something like that. Uh, there's been a ton of research on this. Um, shout out to Tom and Amy, uh, two of the global experts on this. I can send links if folks want to read about it. Uh, a major study at Google a few years ago found that psychological safety is one of the most important drivers uh, of an organization's engineering, but also otherwise team success. Because you think about it, if you don't feel safe uh, for whatever set of reasons, you're not going to be honest. You're not going to give your best foot forward and you're worried. Um, you're spending so much emotional, intellectual energy uh, being worried um, uh, that it, it really takes away from taking risks and putting yourself out there. So I say that because um, it's absolutely true. We we all absolutely have blockers on a regular basis and new ones emerge even if we, if we uh, if we try to tackle them. So one of the first things to be, uh, I think, an effective global organization is to try really hard uh, to get psychological safety right. Um, a couple things I'd say we do, it comes a lot from role modeling. Um, uh, senior leaders have to show uh, that they're really open um, to suggestions, feedback, criticism um, uh, from all sources. One of, uh, part of our onboarding at SEMA uh, is to, uh, as I and others remind new colleagues, in their first two weeks at SEMA, they should tell me, the CEO, that I'm incorrect. Because if you can tell the CEO is incorrect, um, uh, it's you're really safe, right? If you can say bad things, you know, things about that. The team actually yesterday, uh, we're, uh, we're implementing launch darkly for feature flags. So a, a certain feature is on or off and there's different flags. Uh, and the team, the engineering team put in a, a flag for bugs only to show up on the CEO's account. <laughs> uh, of course, it's not real. I mean, maybe it's real, but it's certainly not going to go to customers. And you think about, you know, how I'm so proud of them for that joke. Uh, just, you know, we're having a good time and they're honest. They're, they're able to make that kind of joke. And so I actually measure how much people are teasing me as a good indicator about how, how safe the organization is. Side note, because I, I don't want to lose this, another really good reason to share things in public, to learn in public in open source repositories is if you say something stupid, uh, air quotes, and someone treats you bad or someone disrespects you, quit. <laughs> the world needs, uh, there's so many open source projects full of really wonderful people who want help. So just go somewhere else because uh, there's plenty of other places that are open. And so, you know, I like to say, behave with others like you've known them for decades or at least a decade. Uh, and if that doesn't work out, 
you have options. You certainly have options in open source. Uh, and so assume that there's psychological safety and if not, move on. It's kind of a long aside. That was like sort of the, the overview of psychological safety. I mean, I think a couple things, a um, couple things we do that are, are really good Incredible. It's all led by our culture team, um, uh, which is uh, totally amazing, international, uh, and at people at different levels of the organization. They make sure onboarding is really, really good. Um, we are really anal about meetings, um, trying to find meeting times that work for everyone, which doesn't work. There's very few times that work exactly for everyone, but um, sometimes we can. Um, and then we do a lot in writing. Um, um, one that's easier when folks are speaking multiple native languages on top of this um uh but also uh to prevent um uh prevent blocks to make it as detailed as possible so you can read it rather than having to have a live conversation amazing thanks for sharing about that new uh, concept uh with us matt and uh one more one thing one of the things you mentioned about like communication so you also mentioned that uh, some some folks may tell you that okay this is incorrect or this is how it should be um what are your like some of the best practices when it comes to giving and receiving feedback and uh, constructively criticizing someone for example because oftentimes when it comes to like sharing your opinions on like socials it may come off as uh not at not like it would have been intended uh, by the person so how do you make sure that when you're giving someone criticism they take it in a positive way. Sure. I'm going to answer this in two parts. One part is I imagine many members, many folks listening to this are junior members of a team, are new to a team, are not, uh, are not managers. So I want to answer it from that perspective. And then I want to talk about it for folks who are managers or leaders of an organization. Um, uh, first on, um, if you're not a manager or a leader of a, of a team or an organization, uh, unfortunately, um, but we got to be real, um, you, many organizations uh, do not follow best practices on giving and receiving feedback. And what you need to do is adapt your approach to, um, to the methods of your, uh, of your manager and of your team. I wish it wasn't so. I wish that people could show up and say, hey, I have a suggestion. Let us follow best practices for giving and receiving feedback. Here's some guidance. Let's do it this way. That almost never works. I would really never recommend it uh, because um, most organizations aren't that open to that kind of feedback. I might call it meta feedback, feedback about giving feedback. And so for juniors, the most important thing, um, most important thing is first to watch. Um, before, um, before you give feedback of any kind, I would spend at least a week or two observing, um, how other people do it and especially people with power in the organization, how they give feedback and how they receive feedback. A, a person with power might be a maintainer, could be, you know, soft power. Um, and then also watch how people give feedback to those people, um, with, uh, with power. You're not going to model yourself on the person with power. You're going to model yourself on the person who is giving that person feedback. So or do they tease that person? Do they say you're wrong? Do they say I might do it differently? So watch how people communicate with that person. Uh, and I would I would mimic that. Um, and it, that may seem artificial, but I think in a craft, first thing you should do is watch and learn from others. And so see what methods work for others in sharing feedback. Um, uh, that's probably step one. Step two, frequently when people say feedback, um, they mean criticism uh, or things to do differently. Uh, I think it's a, it's a bad habit, but from universal experience, you know, if I said, Kunal, I'd like to give you some feedback, almost always that means negative things are about to come, uh, which is a total shame. Uh, because feedback is um, positive and negative. It really definitionally is that. And also, people are way more open and more responsive to receiving positive feedback than they are uh, positive feedback than they are uh, negative. And 
I, regardless of how much psychological safety there is in an organization, I, I, I like to say this and why we like to follow it, it is always the right time, always the right time to be giving positive feedback. Uh, and you should choose your battles. You should decide if you're ready or not. Um, uh, decide if it's the right time to give, to give negative. Positive feedback must be um, specific, uh, must be specific uh, and obviously must be real. You're going to be authentic. Uh, too often, um, people think because it's positive, you can be generic. And I actually think we, um, it's not obvious, but this is a really important point. The problem with generic feedback is that it is hard to, um, uh, it is hard to believe it because we use, we use it so often and it's easy to say specific feedback almost always means the person was listening, uh, the giver was listening and, you know, it's, it's more trustworthy to the, to the recipient. So let me give you an example. Uh, Kunal, you are an incredible dude and you have built this amazing community, uh, um, of community classroom. It's incredible. And I am so impressed. That's actually true. I actually believe those words from my heart. You may or may not believe it because it's pretty big, right? It's pretty big. And sometimes there's an expression puffery. I mean, just kissing up or whatever. It's, it's very generic. Let me give some specific, let me try it a different way. Kunal, uh, you seem to be working all the time. Uh, the number of uh, the moments in time that when I'm trying to do the, the clock of how many different hours in the day you are online uh, is really unbelievable. Um, early morning, early night, all the time. You, as far as I can tell, are the only person managing the Discord channel, and you are writing individual responses to hundreds, thousands of people. Uh, I have no idea how you manage that time, and so many people, and how many people you're able to keep track of those conversations. And I have never seen you um, lose your temper or express frustration, even though I personally have seen many different comments on the Discord channel. Listen to this, people, where someone should have looked it up, looked up the answer first, when someone should have been appreciative rather than saying, when's the next video coming out? Um, your equipose, your ability to stay calm when people are, I'd say, a little bit disrespectful is... Uh, it's extremely impressive and it's a role model for everyone else in the community, right? I also believe that just like I believe the first one, but it's so much more specific that it's much more likely, I hope you're nodding. So I, I, I hope this is real. And so on the negative side, we, most of us have learned um, you, don't, uh, you don't give general negative feedback. Kunal, I hate how you write. Like you would never say that it's, oh, you made, there's a semicolon missing, please add that semicolon. That is specific negative feedback. What I'm encouraging everyone to do is to make your positive feedback as specific as that, um, exactly that level of detail, because it just, it hits differently. The audience hears it differently. Having some action items with the negative feedback is extremely important because otherwise it just looks like, okay, I get it. What do you want me to do about it? So yeah, that makes sense. And exactly. appreciate you giving the you know uh, the shout out over there as well. Uh, really, really means a lot. Awesome. And uh, just moving ahead with like the learning in public part. So we talked about like communicating in public and giving and receiving feedback, helping others. What are some of the other ways like folks can get started with learning in public? Let's let's talk about specifics like like Twitter, GitHub, LinkedIn stuff, and content creation, blogging. So many ideas, right? Um, so how, how does one like, uh, how, how, how should one get started? Sure. So the mental model for learning in public is you're not going to be very good at it to start. Uh, and the point by learning, by doing things that other people can see, whether or not it's in, um, uh, in code, whether it's coding or content or anything, is you're just going to get, um, you're just going to get better over time while you do it. So first off is just be okay with that um, because you, you're, uh, one, you're going to learn faster by making more mistakes and having people see them um, by acting rather than not acting. And second, um, 
it actually is easier and more impressive to an audience to see that you've gotten better over time than to just be um, great from the beginning. Um, just as an aside, um, I, I think the grading, great, school grades is a really good example. Um, remind me, it goes up to 8.0 8 is a perfect grade average and frequently? 8.0 8 is good. What's perfect? Yeah. The perfect is, I think, 10. 10. Yeah. Okay, so let's say um, in your first four semesters at school, you had a 10.0 average. Um, that is actually less, can be less impressive than having a four, a six, then an eight, then a nine in semesters one, two, three, four. Uh, obviously, it depends on the school and it depends on the major. Um, but what the second story tells is you got better. You figured out how to learn. There's a trajectory of the data. Um, started not very good and then became much better. If you got tens all the way through, maybe you weren't being challenged. Um, and again, it depends on the school. If it's a great school, a great major, fine. But if you're, if it's not like absolute best, 10 might mean you just weren't pushing yourself enough. And that kind of trajectory is really important to employers because it shows, oh, this person can learn and this person knows how to work harder and get better and better at what you do. That same principle, grades was one example, is true for content, is true for uh, true for coding and otherwise. Um, I'd say another principle is finding a community of folks who are going to help. Um, and so if you're learning to um, if you're learning to blog, if you're learning to uh, post on Twitter, um, to find a group of people who are also doing it uh, and create a, either join a community or create a community because you want you want the feedback, you want people giving you authentic with psychological safety, uh, authentic feedback on how you're doing. Um, in the coding side, um, you want to go to, especially if you're joining open source, which is an incredible way to learn in public, you want to join a, a community that is extremely, um, that's open to, uh, to newcomers and gives a lot of feedback. The way that you can tell, um, uh, look, follow that repository, follow that project and see what the feedback looks like. Are there open pull requests? Are they getting uh, approved? Is there feedback on through code reviews coming in? Um, check that out. Um, and that'll give you a sense of how much feedback is happening. Thanks for sharing, Matt. And just adding on to it, you mentioned about like finding communities. Um, how does one do that? Because the question I have gotten most is that, how do you find the right community? If it's too big, then you may have some difficulty getting involved. And if it is too small, then you may not get much traction. So what is your, uh, what are you use on that? Completely agree. Um, and you've, you've heard me mention and double check that the Goldilocks story makes sense. If it's too big, uh, you could get lost, or maybe you're not, um, your skills aren't good enough yet to contribute to a really big repository. That usually is something like a, you know, a framework that Facebook is building, especially early in your career, it's really not worth it for you to try to help there because you really want to be helpful. And then too small, there may not be enough work going on. Um, one step uh, is to get advice from uh, experts like uh, Kunal, experts like uh, any and any hub on repositories, on projects that are looking for and really newcomer friendly. Uh, I would really um, start, with, start with experts like Kunal who already uh, have lists of suggestions of where to start. Second, I would look you know, your first two weeks, one or two weeks, I would follow a couple, pick two or three and just watch, um, follow the notifications, look how much activity there is, look at the code reviews, uh, look at the pull requests and see how people communicate with each other and see how much action is going on. So that will give you a sense. Um, and then, so I would follow two or three and then especially getting started, pick one. Uh, it's really important to do a small number of things really well, then a large number of things lightly. That's better for learning, excuse me, that's better for learning, that's better for um, demonstrating commitment. Um, so even if there's many that you find interesting, um, pick, start with one and do a really good job with that. And the last one, um, uh, some people, and it's, it's absolutely true, some people, absolutely appropriate, use working in open source 
as a way to learn new languages, learn new frameworks, new something. That's, that is perfectly fine, but I would actually not do it for your first, for the first time you're joining a, an open source community. I would be as helpful as you possibly can. Um, and that means starting with something you already know. What the first time that you're working in open source, uh, it's probably true anywhere, but especially in open source, you want to be, you're just practicing being a good contributor, an open source contributor. And the more useful you can be, the less you have to worry about getting the content right. And the more you can just focus on learning the norms, learning communication, learning how to be a good contributor and then perhaps become a maintainer. So even if you're doing Java and you're passionate about JavaScript, you want to learn JavaScript, I'd still start in a community, a welcoming, correctly sized community for Java until you know that you're a good contributor. And then being a good contributor, then you can go use, um, have the right approach when you're going to go use an open source repository to learn a new language. I love that point about, you know, using open source to learn new things. And that's true because these projects are really big. And, uh, you know, um, if you don't know something, <clears throat> sorry, so you find yourself in a place where you look at a project, you want to contribute to it, and you don't know a particular tech stack, that's a, like a silver lining. Now you get to learn something new and you'll also get to contribute. Mm -hmm. Students often, I, I don't think there's anything called like imposter syndrome with students because students are like people expect students not to know stuff, right? So imposter syndrome is what? I don't know something that those people know so many things. That is what imposter syndrome is. You feel like you're underqualified. Students are, that, that's one of the natures of students. They're learning, they're starting out, right? So what is the sort of imposter syndrome you may have? It's an opportunity. Now, I, I'm, I'm not saying that you may not get that feeling. Definitely you will. You will see other people like having so much skills and you're like, why, do, why don't I have that skill or whatever? But take it in a positive way rather than like, you know, um, that I don't know anything. So there's no shame in not being skilled about a particular tech or whatever that you want to do, but there is shame in staying that way, right? So if you have some goals, you want to contribute to a project, you want to, you just got into a new internship and they, uh, they have some projects or whatever, and you don't know much about it, that's okay. Communicate, learn, learn by doing, ask questions, just make some progress, just get started with it. So absolutely no worries if you are new, if you don't know anything, it's totally fine. But you can, like Matt said, you can use open source to learn and contribute. I did that uh, in my freshman year. I always learn by doing in open source, and I think that has been a great, um, you know, uh, has been worked has worked out pretty well for me. Yeah. Well, awesome. And remember, if you're joining an open source project uh, and you have imposter feeling imposter syndrome, and they make you feel bad and they make you feel shame. You know what I'm going to say? Walk away. <laughs> Go yeah. to another one. Go to another one. Because there's plenty of places you understand that students are yeah. here to learn. So yeah. if you feel it, that's fine. We all get have those feelings. But if someone else makes yeah. you feel it, forget it. Go somewhere else. Yeah, even in internships, uh, the, the great internships, one of the ways to highlight, you know, and like uh, recognize good internships is so when you're interning at place, they will ask you, how can we help you in your career? You, they don't expect interns to be like, you know, production level seniors or whatever. Uh, everyone knows that internships are learning experiences. And if a company does not know that, then, you know, uh, you, nothing is wrong with you. It's something wrong with the company. Cool. Um, speaking of hiring people and, uh, you know, Matt, you have quite a lot of experience with that. Tying that into the discussion that we're having about learning in public, let's talk about career options. So how does learning in public help uh in getting a job or an internship or whatever. And what have your experiences been like when you are hiring people? Sure. So any kind of learning um, can help advance your career, but the benefits of learning in public is that not only are you developing skills and knowledge, but other things could be coming at the same time. You could be uh, networking, you could be getting to know people um, because, or they getting to know you because of the work that you're doing, whether it's writing that's public or whether it's contributing to uh, an open source project. 
um, I think that's um, so that's one of the other benefits. That's one of the benefits of learning in public. Second, um, in many situations, the learning that you are doing in public is effectively very similar to the work that you are doing, you would be doing in a job. And here as well, in, and for engineers, um, contributing to open source projects, in many cases, certainly uh, at the, uh, certainly it would have been true at, the, at my university, is a lot closer to, um, working on an open source project is a lot closer to the work you'd be doing as an engineer than it is in a, let's say a lecture uh, about the theory of, of coding or, or some theoretical based approach. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's a huge and incredibly useful underpinning, uh, but um, coding on an open source project is applied. Again, code reviews, which you know SEMA has spent a lot of time on, uh, code reviews are a fundamental part of almost every organization you'll, um, you might ever join as an engineer. Um, if you may or may not be getting, uh, doing code reviews or receiving code reviews um, in your university classes, but you absolutely could and should um, be going to open source projects and becoming a good contributor, uh, have, receiving uh, 10, 50, 100 um, uh, pull requests, uh, pull request uh, reviews over the course of uh, six months, a year, whatever. And that is really real experience um, that is, um, could be very additive, um, you know, frankly, regardless uh, of what your university experience is. So I'd say learning in public uh, is a huge part that contributes. Um, doing a tiny number of things extremely well and only adding things to your plate when you can do them well uh, is, um, is a really good sign for employers because it shows that um, you are competent in the sense of if you're going to do something, you're going to do it well. Uh, maybe the opposite of competent is flaky or indecisive or something. So picking a small number and really being maximally helpful, I think is huge is hugely helpful. Um, finding finding things that are hard to do, um, certainly hard for you, and maybe they're also hard for the organization. Good uh, good organizations when they're hiring, um, sh coding and otherwise, should be asking um, experiential interview questions, meaning questions about your previous experience. Um, and again, we can have a long conversation about uh, what's wrong with engineer engineering interviews in particular. But basically, um, if we're interviewing at SEMA, I will always ask, tell me about something hard you have done. What made it hard? What did you do? And what happened? Uh, and a good interviewer will be looking for just how difficult was it? Um, what was the, you know, the degree of difficulty? Oh, a really hard thing I had to do was clean up all of the dishes in my, in my apartment because it was messy. That's actually not that hard. You want to pick something hard right, and show. And then um, depending on the organization, how much success you've had may or may not be as important as how hard you worked. Um, but finding, signing yourself up for hard things and doing the best job you can and putting a lot of energy into them, um, gives you experience, it gives you skill, uh, skill and knowledge, but also is, um, for the right kinds of organizations is a way, um, is a way to be successful in interviews. Um, I think those are probably the biggest lessons. Um, you know, I really... I'm really a fan for engineers who want to get in to spend, um, to really invest time. We talked about doing a small number of things. Um, open source, I think is, there's obviously exceptions, but it's probably one of the most important other things you can do. Um, one, because it is, it's easier to get into and easier than to get out of a formal internship where you go through a process, once you start it, you have to be in it. Uh, it may or may not be good. And in, uh, whereas if you work in open source, you can spend a week or two watching. You can then make one pull request and see what happens and see if they treat you with respect or not. So it is, it's more informal to start, which I think is a huge advantage. I have signed up for internships uh, earlier in my career and I, I was wrong. <laughs> I didn't understand what I was looking for. I asked the wrong questions. But once you're in it, quitting looks terrible. Um, whereas in open source, you know, if you're just doing a little bit of work up front, 
you get you can learn so much about whether or not you want to continue. Um, and I think that without mucking up your resume or mucking up re uh, reputation or something. Um, and uh, if you make a good contribution, uh, it is possible to transition from that to their um, career um, into an organization's career uh, pipeline. Definitely do not start by trying to contribute to Facebook's open source because you want a job at Facebook. That is an extremely low likelihood, um, a likelihood approach. Pick a medium size, the correct size project, be a great contributor. Once you be become a great contributor, maybe become a great maintainer because those are even harder. Um, then once you become a great maintainer, then you can actually look for open source projects that are sponsored by somewhere you'd like to hire or at least related to a place to a place you'd like to be hired by or are related to that. And again, you can do all of this on um, separately without formally signing up, without going through a, re a recruiter process. Um, I think it is, it's a, it's a hack. It's a really good idea for, for engineers to be spending some of that extra capacity. And of course you're gonna do it well um, to be learning in public through open source as a way for for career advancement amazing and that's a that's a very practical uh, advice and not just the company's projects but the other open source projects that the company may be using if you're contributing to that as well can of also definitely uh, you know help you um but uh, yeah i mean absolutely amazing thanks a lot for sharing matt and uh, we'll be doing more and more such sessions about uh, career advancement and uh, always a pleasure talking to you um, for folks who are who are watching, uh, make sure to check out like the links in the description below. Uh, I'll create a separate like playlist around it uh, of all the uh, streams that we do with uh, your Matt and all the career live streams that we have done. And uh, you can check out the Sema blog as well in case in case you missed the Discord session. So we have Matt has written an amazing blog on that. But once again, appreciate you giving the time, Matt. Uh, thanks again for joining, and I'll see you in the next one. I really enjoyed it, Camille. Have a great day, and thanks again, everybody.